Hey friends, happy Sunday. Welcome back to our weekly Materia Medica series. I'm so honored to have you join me today. I'm here at the beautiful Sage Mountain Botanical Sanctuary in central Vermont. And I'm just delighted to talk to you today about one of my favorite fall herbs, goldenrod. As a gentle reminder, no video, book, post on social media should replace seeing a healthcare provider if you're dealing with a medical condition. I'm delighted to talk about goldenrod today because it's a ubiquitous herb that's found all over the East Coast, especially in this autumn season. And it's in the genus Solidago. There's Solidago odora, Solidago canadensis, Solidago omifolia, Solidago gigantea. In Florida alone, there are over 20 species that are considered native. And you find Solidago growing from Florida to Texas and Arkansas all the way north to Nova Scotia. The Solidago genus is mostly native to North America, but there are a few species that are native to South America and Eurasia. Several of our North American species have hitchhiked across the pond and are now found naturalized throughout parts of Europe. The genus, Latin name Solidago, means to become whole or to strengthen. And when Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus gave the name to this plant, it was an indication of its historic medicinal uses. One of the most common medicinal species of the Solidago genus, Odora, is given that name as a nod to its aromatic or fragrant properties. Solidago is the state flower of South Carolina, Kentucky, and Nebraska, and it's also the state herb for the state of Delaware. As you can see beside and behind me, Solidago grows to about two to five feet tall. It's a hardy perennial, and its leaves are alternate on the stem, they are narrow and pointed, and they usually have a smooth or entire leaf margin or a slightly hairy leaf margin. The stems are also slightly hairy. The common name goldenrod is a nod to the dense golden yellow flowers that appear at the top of these plants from midsummer through late fall. Its flowers are branched in clusters at the top of the stems and the shape and arrangement of the clusters varies based on the species. Goldenrod is in the Asteraceae family, the aster family or the composite family, which is typified by its compound flowers, meaning that each of these flowers is actually a cluster of tiny flowers grouped together. Most of the Solidago species have these beautiful golden yellow flowers, but a few, such as Solidago bicolor, can appear with white flowers. Possibly one of the most unique features botanically of this plant is that there is such a variation in how these golden flowers are arranged on the stem. Wands and plumes of these radiate or discoid flowers appear grouped with numerous flower heads in complex compound arrangements, inflorescences that are grouped by racemes, panicles, or secund arrays. There are so many variations in goldenrod flowers that it's easy to appear in a flowering meadow of goldenrod and have dozens of species all living together. There are so many variations in the flower arrangements and clusters of goldenrod that it can be difficult to differentiate which species you're working with. I'll put some links in the description below, but some of my favorite resources for identifying which species of goldenrod I'm working with include Go Botany, iNaturalist, Garden Plant Finder, and Plant Snap. Goldenrod may often be confused with ragweed, a plant that's also in the Asteraceae family, but it's found in the Ambrosia genus. Now, ragweed is one of the most famous herbs for causing seasonal allergies, especially allergic rhinitis. And goldenrod, its cousin, is often vilified for the same thing, but it's very rare for someone to experience pollen allergies from goldenrod. The reason being that the pollen on these flowers is very heavy and sticky. It usually requires a pollinator like a bee or a bug to carry it forth from flower to flower. 
Unlike ragweed pollen, which is very light and airy and floats along the wind, hence giving us such a widespread experience of allergies. I would caution that if you do experience ragweed or pollen or seasonal allergies, that you may wish to start working with goldenrod in a very small amount just to test and make sure that for some idiosyncratic reason, it doesn't aggravate your allergic condition. Goldenrod is what we know of as a ruderal species, which means it's a pioneer in disturbed soils. It's one of the first plants that comes into a cleared area and turns it into a beautiful glowing meadow. It spreads through woody rhizomes and it can send out a patch of other plant starters within its circumference, within its area, so that what seems like overnight, but in a very short period of time, you can go from one little tiny sprig of goldenrod to a huge patch in an area like this. For that reason, goldenrod is a perennial that you rarely see growing solo. Almost always you find it in colonies and clusters as appear in this little meadow right here. The various species of goldenrod are pretty adaptable to their growing habitat and you find them in a variety of different soils and environments depending on the species. Some of them will grow in sandy soil, others prefer a loamy soil. Some species really like a dry sandy area, others really prefer a moist rich soil. Some of them will grow in the shade and some really prefer full sun. It's all about the nuance of the species as well as some of the varieties among the species. Now, of course, I'm sharing about goldenrod today because it's such a valuable medicine. The fact that it's so ubiquitous up and down the East Coast and has such a variety of medicinal properties is part of why we include goldenrod as one of the 20 herbs we cover in our Roots of Herbalism program. But more importantly, I want to start out by sharing with you what an important plant goldenrod is for pollinators of all kinds. To start, goldenrod blooms from late summer through mid-autumn, a time when a lot of other flowers in the environment are starting to fade. So because of its seasonal nature, it gives pollinators a source of food and a host during a time where other plants are starting to fade. Ecology professor Douglas Tallamy says of goldenrod that across the United States, Solidago is the top ranked genus in terms of hosting ecologically valuable caterpillars that feed breeding birds and migrants. It's not just caterpillars that call goldenrod home. Butterflies, bumblebees, wasps, moths, and a host of other insects feast on goldenrod in the fall. In turn, wasps and birds find their food source by hovering in an area where goldenrod grows. There's even a specific spider called the goldenrod spider which is known for colonizing in these beautiful flower tops because it knows it's such a potent area where it's going to find ample sources of food among the other insects that are feeding on the goldenrod flowers. There are over 300 species of bees native to North America that depend on these flowers for their nectar and pollen. So goldenrod serves as a pollinator habitat, which in turn serves as a bird habitat, which in turn serves as a predator habitat, as larger species use patches of goldenrod as a hunting ground. Therefore, this plant is really supporting an entire diversity of an ecosystem. Even after these beautiful flowers have faded, goldenrod serves as a source of food and winter habitat for winter birds, as well as for voles and mice, which in turn feed larger predators like hawks, owls, weasels, coyotes, and fox. Believe it or not, goldenrod was considered a major beverage tea in the late 1700s, just following the Boston Tea Party. In fact, there were attempts to commercialize goldenrod and even export it to China. Now it's fallen out of favor as a commercial tea blend, but any herbalist will tell you the goldenrod leaves and flowers, especially from the Solidago odora species, are a delightful beverage blend. 
Soledago odora is the species that's most preferred as a beverage tea because as the species odora name suggests, its leaves are fragrant or aromatic. They're known for a characteristic scent that's somewhat like anise. And so all you have to do if you're in an area of goldenrod and you're not sure which species is rich is just take a leaf, crush it, smell it, and see if it has that characteristic anise flavor or scent. This one mm, certainly does. Now, I've studied with Southern medicine folk that will employ the root medicinally, but from a modern herbal standpoint, we're primarily working with the leaves and the flowers of goldenrod. The energetics of this plant can vary based on the species. Some are a bit more warming, others are a bit more cooling. In general, goldenrod is known to be astringent and to be aromatic or pungent but the drying astringent nature or the aromatic pungent nature of this plant does vary species to species. So like any study of energetics, I encourage you to get to know the goldenrod in your garden or in your backyard through your senses by smelling and tasting the plant. Does it taste dry on your tongue? Is the spicy flavor and smell very strong? That's the best way to know species to species the energetics of the plants that you have growing in your backyard. Those varying energetics may determine how you employ that species of goldenrod in your medicinal practice. Now I mentioned earlier that Carl Linnaeus, the Swedish botanist, named goldenrod soledago for becoming whole or strengthening, and that's a nod to its historic use as a vulnerary. I don't find a lot of modern herbalists that work with it in that way. Vulnerary is a term that means wound healing. I have, however, worked with leaves and flowers of goldenrod in a salve, and how I have most preferred to use them is actually on insect stings and bug bites. I found it to have a beautiful ability to heal the skin very quickly, but also to soothe the irritation from the insect sting. One of the systems of the body that I find most allied with goldenrod is the upper respiratory system. The leaves and flowers can tone tissue and they can act as a decongestant or an expectorant if you have excess mucus. So I love working with this herb for upper respiratory infections, for irritation of the sinuses, for coughs and for common colds. Whether it's due to a cold or a chest infection or just a long day of teaching, I love to use goldenrod leaves and flowers to soothe sore and irritated throats. This has also been an important ally for me in addressing seasonal allergies, especially the, those that appear with symptoms like allergic rhinitis, watery itchy eyes, itchy sinuses, that burning and irritating sensation. I love working with the leaves and flowers of goldenrod as a tea or as a tincture to help shorten the duration of those symptoms and quickly bring in recovery. Whether it's a runny nose, sneezing, or watery eyes, using goldenrod a few times a day can really help alleviate some of those symptoms of seasonal allergies. Goldenrod is also an ally for the urinary system. Being frequently used for urinary tract infections and bladder infections because of its antiseptic and diuretic properties. I've also found goldenrod flowers and leaves to be a friend of the digestive system. It's a beautiful gentle carminative and its aromatic properties also help to move us through periods of gas and bloating while its astringent properties can help address symptoms of diarrhea. Overall, I find this plant to be a beautiful, gentle, but effective ally against all sorts of colds and flus. Its astringency helps to dry up excess fluids while its antiseptic properties help to address the pathogens. This herb is also beautiful for alleviating mild fevers, which I've employed as a tea, as a tincture, or by preparing a strong infusion of goldenrod and adding it to a lukewarm bath. Last but not least, goldenrod is a favored ally for me in joints and muscles, dealing with aches and pains and inflammation, whether it's due to arthritis or simply a long day in the garden. I've loved working with goldenrod to help ease those aches and pains. I appreciate this herb, especially when infused into an oil 
and used as an infused oil or a salve topically on those achy, tender joints and muscles. But you may also find relief from aches and pains of the joints and muscles by using this herb internally as a tea or tincture combined with topical use. A phytochemical study of goldenrod will reveal that it is rich in nutrients, especially antioxidants. And for that reason, I love to infuse goldenrod in vinegar to use in my kitchen as a marinade or a salad dressing for its rich nutritive properties. But even an infusion will help confer some of those same nutrients as well. There are a myriad of medicines we can make with goldenrod. Goldenrod tea, goldenrod tincture, goldenrod vinegar, infusing goldenrod in honey, infusing goldenrod in oil and adding that oil to a salve. And I've even worked with goldenrod as a poultice topically, which is a compress on the skin directly in areas where there are muscle aches or joint pains. Of course, many of my students know that one of my favorite medicines from goldenrod is the flower essence. The flower essence of goldenrod is employed in times when we need to feel a stronger sense of self and also when we need to connect more to the things in our life that bring us joy. Do you have any favorite recipes that include goldenrod? Or any questions about ways you might work with this beautiful plant? Leave those in the comments below or drop us an email. We love learning along with you about these favorite plant allies. If you've enjoyed this video, and you wanna keep receiving fresh herb content in your inbox each week, then like the video and subscribe to our channel so we can keep you posted on our next herbal series. Ha! Ah, thank you so much for the honor of spending time with me in my garden today, learning about one of my favorite plant allies. Until next time, may the flowers of the garden bring you radiant health and peace to your heart. Many blessings.